Here's a place where all of us can be safe. Our stories of transformation can be safe, and all the things we want to research are safe here. This is Safe Space with Cheyenne. I'm really excited you're here, and I hope you stick around for a while, because I've got a lot to show you before I leave Earth. I love you guys. All right, welcome back, my friends. I have quite a story for you. I've been doing research on this for a couple months. I think that would be the easiest way to say it. As soon as I heard about Chris Bledsoe, um, I also found out that it is the most still to this day researched case from the CIA, NASA, and a bunch of strings of professors. So I don't want to give too many details away, but we're going to talk about this book published. It's called UFO of God. And it's about an encounter that Chris Bledsoe and a few, his son and a few of his, I guess, fellow workers, you could say, experienced um, several years ago. Um, don't even grab a notebook, just turn the volume up and listen to this story. Because I've been doing my research, like I said, for about a month. And this is a really fascinating take on an extraterrestrial experience, I would say. So, Chris, thank you so much and welcome into the show. Thank you for having me, Cheyenne. I really um, I'm honored to be here. I'm really excited. Like I said, I have been listening to the other podcast that you've been on. I got a copy of your book the other day that I'm excited to dig into. I, will, I do want to point out um, all the shares that you were on were great. I really enjoyed it. But I really, really did enjoy Bledsoe Said So. I watched the video and I started following them on Spotify because I really, I like the way that the content is set up. I even like all the pictures on the wall in the background. And um, I love that it's just family continuing the education as well. So I want to yeah. give them a little shout out because I really enjoyed learning that one. Yeah, I love, appreciate that. This, uh, my youngest son, Ryan. Uh, he was 13 when all this went down, and he was at the ripe age of uh, of just being into it, right? His older brother, Chris Jr., was with me when it happened in 07, and it just terrified him, and it, it caused a lot of um, uh, it, it, it caused a lot of problems, and we'll get into that later. Um, and his brother, Jeremy, he was at like 15 years old and into girls in school. And, and it just really um, affected my whole family. But Ryan was that guy that was uh, into it, right? And he was always right beside me uh, wanting to learn and study. And he's just continued on. Now he's be 30 years old shortly. And he's doing real well with that podcast. Well, I'm happy to hear that. It's very entertaining. I really am excited to get into the other ones. I got snippets of the other ones I was listening to, and then I had to go back to my research because I knew I was going to be talking to you soon. Um, I was driving my daughter to daycare today, and I was really excited to come and talk to you. And I was thinking about how much courage it actually took to not only tell the story in the beginning, but continue to tell the story and then write a book later because I did see on the other interviews how it did take a toll on your family. And I mean, obviously your mental health at the time, because your beliefs before this, like, did you believe in anything extraterrestrial of any kind? Because I know you're a no, religious no. man. Yeah, I, you know, in those days I was, uh, well, Still to this day, um, my family, I married a Pentecostal holiness girl, which is deeply religious, and uh, we'll be married 40 years this year in June. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. And um, when it all happened back then, they didn't accept it like I thought they may, you know what I mean? So uh, it caused a, a, a tremendous stress on the family. Of course, my wife. Uh, she did the best she could be to be a mama and keep the fear and all down in our house and kind of living in two worlds, living in the paranormal world with us. She was seeing it. After I came home within a few days, it started appearing in the house. And um, she had to live in two worlds, into the Pentecostal holiness and be 
hear everything and and try to be that normal mom and bring her children to church and then come home and so it was quite uh, it's been quite the journey I have definitely. to say definitely yeah. so where would you like to begin the story I know if you had to give it in grave detail that it would take you about two to three hours so you yeah. I was listening today and your subcontractors had just finished up a project. They wanted to go fishing to celebrate. So you weren't really into the fishing thing. So you started taking a walk through the woods to kind of clear your head with all the other things that were going on in your life. Yeah. And this is the day that your life changed forever. Yeah. And I'll tell you why I wasn't fishing. I'll get go back just to peace from there. Uh, in, in 2001, um, is when it all started south for myself and the family. Uh, we were, uh, a home, I was a home builder. Um, I had been in business almost 20 years, building houses, and we were one of the biggest in town, building 100 homes a year, uh, around that average. And uh, when 911 happened, it destroyed the building business, the market. In our town is a VA market, um, Fort Bragg. And so it shut the spigot off like, you know, no tomorrow. Just turned the switch off. No more sales. I had 72 houses under construction at that time. And so I watched us, my whole life's earnings uh, because of a freak act of, you know, this sudden thing blowing up this building uh, just started draining me and the interest rates were, were high then in the 8% range on barred money. And, uh, so those 30, 40,000 a month going out, not counting overhead, no sales. So I was spending a hundred grand a month between overhead and, and everything. And, um, Along about two years into that, I was beginning to sell apartments and everything I could sell short selling homes to, to try to get out from under this interest. And I had been dealing with IBS since I was 22 or three years old, 24. And it, 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 it turned into what they call Crohn's disease. And it irritated that condition so bad to where I began to uh, deteriorate where I couldn't get out of bed. So I was at the bottom of my life, uh, unable to work, sick beyond um, what dealing with life was tough. I mean, I was like in the restroom 20, 25 times a day. That's what Crohn's disease is about uh, when it's really bad. And so I had to sell everything I had. I've lost everything I own. I'm 46, and I'm, I'm fast forwarding to 2007 now. So all that happened from 01 to 07. 04, I had a near death experience um, in the hospital. I was completely covered up from head to toe with a sheet, and I came out from under there, and I saw my wife crying, and the doctors walk in the room, and um, but I, I, I came back from that. So um, I just wanted the viewers to know where I was suffering beyond what any, uh, I mean, it was just that bad. So my, my state of mind was uh, depression, uh, but I faked it. I hid it. I had to be a dad. I had to raise these four children of mine. My little girl was nine, ten years old, and three boys, and trying to be a husband. and. Um, so we're going to start at 2007, January the 8th, which is by, well, ironically, Elvis Presley's birthday. I'll never forget that. Wonderful. This one lady called me and said, I saw it that night. And what you saw, it came over my daughter and I. And I thought, uh, I, first thing I thought was Elvis Presley's come home. Because she reminded me it was <laughs> uh, his birthday. But so... January the 8th, um, my, the subcontractors had uh, traveled back out of town uh, right after Christmas. They went to finish this project. They come home with a check. Um, 
and had finished the punch list. And it was midday. They called me and said, let's celebrate, boss. Let's go. Let's go fishing. What do you say? Well, my wife was out of town with her mother. Uh, or with her children, with our children, all but Junior. Junior was with me, Chris Junior. He was 17. And I'm like, son, you want to go fishing today? And he said, sure. So uh, they came in, cashed your checks. I picked them up with my truck. It's the only four-wheel drive truck. Um, and where we had to go was across the, from the, the paved road, we had to cross a cornfield, which is about 200 yards across, to the back side. So we're driving a little farmer two-rut road through the middle of the field to, to the back. At the wood line, when you get to the trees at the back side, the road goes downhill uh, due east to the river and then turns and parallels the river. So the whole trip's about an eighth of a mile down and an eighth of a mile to a cul-de-sac. That's right on the bank of the river. So we drove down in there. It was muddy. The trees were tight. Um, we we arrived in this one-acre grassy cul-de-sac where there's a picnic table and a little beach to fish on the river. And the river's not very wide, about 60, 70 yards wide. Um I wasn't into fishing at all. They, nobody had a clue how bad I was suffering uh, mentally and physically, the whole thing. And um, so I just did what a, a, a organizer would do. Uh, being a foreman on jobs, I, I was always organizing people. So I got them fishing. I got them settled. My son was on the, sitting on the shore right beside these three guys. They were grown men. And I said, look, I'm going to walk down in the cul-de-sac, down in the forest, and just see if I see any wildlife. Just an excuse to get away and think, right? So I walked down in the further down in the woods and stayed. I sit alongside a river gully on uh, my back against the oak tree for about an hour or close to it. And the sun's starting to set. In January, it sets at about 30. So I... Um, sat there until it started getting dark in the forest because of the canopy of the trees. It gets dark quicker in the woods when you're in there. And the sun's already down below the top of the trees. So I made my way back out to where they were and said, look, y'all want to go home? I was ready to go home. Uh, I wasn't having fun, right? But they're like, no, boss, we want to fish some more. I said, okay, it's going to get cold tonight. We better get a fire going. So they stopped. Uh, laid their poles down, went around that grassy cul-de-sac. This is around, kind of around pie-shaped cul-de-sac. Uh, around the edge, picking up all the dead tree limbs we could find, and it had a big stack of wood. Got a fire going, and their back, their feet were facing the river. They were sitting right on the river bank, and the fire was behind them, so they were between the fire and the river. I left there about 10 after 5. I told them, y'all have fun. I'm going to walk up to the entrance to the field where we came in, um, to the gate, which the gate's right at the top of the hill, right at the woodland. And so I left walking and um, made my way up, and uh, it, it was kind of dark going through there, the, tree, the sun setting. When I made the curve, the first eighth of a mile, I turned and started west. Now I'm looking up at the gate. It's up there about an eighth of a mile in front of me up at the top of the hill. So I'm walking up this hill, and I'm having to watch every step because it's muddy, and it's getting dark, and I didn't want to walk in my shoes in, you know, a foot deep mud. So I'm jumping from, you know, little from the center between them to just kind of hopping back and forth, just making my way up. I got near the top of that hill, about 20 feet short of the hill. I began to see what I thought was the sun uh, setting, just like you can look at it right before dark and it doesn't hurt your eyes. You know, that big orange ball, beautiful, just something to behold. 
And um, I didn't think about it to start with. I just uh, saw it, the top of it. I looked down and took a few more steps. And as I got three or four steps higher, I could see more of it, you know. And I thought, boy, that looks strange. And I looked down and took a couple more steps. And when I got a little higher, my field of vision began to widen because I'm getting, I'm going with trees up either side. So I can only see up this lane right but when you get near the top you can start to see wider well there's another one there's two setting suns and i'm seeing just about the whole both of them but the bottoms were cut off from the hill like i could not see quite the whole thing and immediately it scared me really bad i mean i'm commercial rated pilot i analyzed everything I knew in this and from Fort Bragg growing up around that I knew it wasn't nothing from here and I'd never thought about UFOs ever because I was so busy working raising a family I didn't get into that I build 100 homes a year it's like seven days a week you know and then running a, a Remax company as well it was just full-time work so it scared me, Cheyenne, so bad that I dropped to my knees. And by doing that, the hills um, uh, hid me. I used the hill to hide me because I was seeing the tops. And I dropped down and I thought, Lord, what do I do? What in the world? I, I went through every thought in my mind and, and curiosity struck. So I crawled hands and knees, up a little higher to where I could raise up like so and, and peep over the top of that hill, and there they were. They were beautiful. They were about 40 to 50 foot across, um, balls of round balls of fire, and the fire was swirling around them so beautiful, and tips of the flames were shooting off like little flames shooting off of them. So were you swaying in between, wow, this is really beautiful, what the hell is going on, and like, am I going crazy, is this really in front of me, is that an alien, like, I had no I mean, it'd be, clue. It'd be absolute shock, right, it's not like you could remember the dialogue you were having with yourself at the time, but I'm putting myself in your shoes as you tell this story. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what I would do if I walked up and I saw like two swirling energetic suns in front of me. Yeah. And I like, I don't, I don't believe any of this stuff. I've never encountered it before. It was never a thought of mine. And like, now here it is in front of you. Like how, like cognitive dissonance is probably the best word I could say for it. Cause you're like, yeah, what am I doing? What's going on? Yeah, uh, it, it was so, um, it was very frightening to see in the reality setting in at the same time that, oh my God, we're not alone. There's something there that's very powerful. And so I was going through all that in my head and I'm trying to hide. I'd peek up and I'd look down and I'd think, you know, and, and run these thoughts through my head and I'd look up and there they were. And so after a few minutes of, uh, going through all those emotions and thoughts and I'd look and I'd hide and I would think and then I made the decision it's time to run that's what I thought you got to go from here my son is down there behind me about a quarter mile and I don't know what's about to happen I'm going to to him uh, and that's all I could think about so um, after I made that decision to run it wasn't until I actually made the move to run when I got the shock of my lifetime. This is when it hit me. Uh, I raised up one last time and I turned. I'm already turning down the hill to run. I'm in the motion, right? I'm standing up. I made the plan. I'm going to run. So I'm, I'm facing uphill. I turned my body downhill and I look over my shoulder one last time when I raised up to see if they were still there and they were and what happened at that very second when my brain said run a third one above me and out in front where i could see the two there and up here a third one appeared exactly like those two 
and it appeared so fast and shot down beside them mother two that um, it was mind boggling with a split second it's beside the other two and at that very moment I knew I was on their radar I knew my hair was standing up right now. Every time I think about that, I knew they saw me. I knew that they had something for me. And sheer terror set in. And so the next thing I remember is I'm running to down the hill. Not really down the hill. The last 50 yards or so, I could see them standing in the fire now is a little small there's three men looking down at the fire not saying much and i ran up out of the dark i was within 20 or 25 feet of them before they saw me because it's so dark down there and i'm like oh you guys won't believe what i just saw i thought 20 minutes had passed is all first thing i hear is where in the world have you been and that is what the language they were using it was a little more <laughs> explicit right but like where have you been i said what do you mean i was confused i said what do you mean i was just up at the hill i had been gone 20 minutes they said no you've been gone all flipping night and that one of the words they used and and so i couldn't compute what they were saying you couldn't have made me believe over 20 minutes had gone. And I noticed right away Junior wasn't there. And so within a minute or two of me arriving to where they were, and there, there's no more wood, the fire is down to a, a just coals good, and Junior's not there. I'm like, where is Chris Junior? They said, well, we took the truck, two of us, and took off looking for you about an hour after dark. When you were gone, we've been looking for you. Um, somebody stayed at the fire, and Chris Jr. went back into the cul-de-sac in the woods where you had gone earlier that day. And I thought, oh, my God, he's gotten in that forest, and it's huge. He goes for miles and miles of big river valleys. He's lost in there. That's all I could think. I panicked. So I ran to the back of the cul-de-sac, and I'm shouting for him, No, nobody answering. Finally, I'm tearing my way into the forest. It's, when you get into the woods around here, it's pretty open because the canopy from the trees shade the ground and not a lot of weeds and stuff, although there are in places. Uh, but along the edge, it's real thick. And so um, I'm going through this thick first 10 foot of stuff and calling for him. And he finally, I uh, hear him, and he comes up from under that stuff. He had what had happened was. Um, and when he comes up, he's, he's crying. He's like, Daddy, where have you been? I'm like, what do you mean, where have I been? He said, you've been gone all night. I've been looking for you. And these creatures, they, they, they had me paralyzed. I couldn't move. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what is he talking about? I said, well, I've only been gone 20 minutes. He said, no, Daddy, you've been gone all night. And so... I actually took him by the arm and, and we walked back to the fire. But what he described was the, the road parallel in the river was an eighth of a mile long. And he was at the back of the cul-de-sac. So he could see the, the, you know, I would say it was probably 60 yards of cul-de-sac plus an eighth of a mile of road. He could see all the way down to the curry. And two red orbs crossed the path way down there while he was back there calling for me. And he saw him go across the road. And um, he ran back to the fire to tell him, I just saw two balls of light. And they're like, don't be messing with his junior. They were telling him that, you know. Uh, and they didn't listen to him real well. So he goes back to where he was, uh, still looking for dad. And he's looking down that cul-de-sac. They came back out of the riverside and come out on the road. Now they're coming to him. They're floating down the road that whole eight, uh, over an eighth of a mile towards him. And so the fire was between him and them on the bank on the right. But he just didn't want to go towards them because they were coming at him. He didn't want to. Uh, he, he just hit. He started hiding. 
he squatted down and you know, they got closer and closer and closer. And when, by the time they got within 20 feet of him or less, he had backed himself and was laying flat on the ground and backed himself under that thick shrubbery around the edge of that cul-de-sac. They saw him. They knew he was there the whole time. One of them was always looking at him. He couldn't yell. He couldn't scream. He couldn't move. He felt paralyzed. So it was a pure nightmare for him. And the whole time they were there, they were. He, he described one of them picking up sticks and bottles and cans and looking at them and throwing them back on the ground. What did they look like? Were they weren't they like about three or four feet tall with like red eyes? Yeah, three feet tall. He described them. I saw the same beings. Uh, they were about three feet tall. They were glowing. Um, and they could adjust their brightness, just like a dimmer on a, on a ceiling fan. You could turn the light or a light. So they would look almost translucent when they're close to you. And when they open their eyes, you could see these bright red eyes glowing. And from a distance, the eyes look like an orb. They're so close, it's just like a ball of light, right? And so um, it... it, it when I got him back to the fire, he is, um, he's all he wants to do is go home. I want to go home, Daddy. I want to go home. I don't want to stay here anymore. I want to go home. And I'm, these three men are standing there and they're like, they're taking all this in. One of them had seen the red or a glimpse of it crossing back out of the river bottom up onto the dirt road. And it spooked them bad. It spooked everybody because here I've been gone nearly four hours, I thought it was 20 minutes. Christopher had been lost for two hours. They'd give up hope finding us, and we're just standing there waiting, hoping somebody would come back. And suddenly, one of the guys shouts, look. And so we, he's pointing up, and we all look up to a beautiful, clear night sky, stars out, and what looked like um, eight or nine stars as bright as Venus brightest star in the sky or serious they just appeared above us and started coming from different directions and came together they went around chasing each other in a circle they went out they came back together it was just beautiful to see but frightening and then three of them comes all the way out of there from way up there what would you would think was stars and landed in front of us across the river right up right behind the bank and they were 40 feet across glowing bright white pulsating poof, poof, like a welder's light that color and the, the river's only 60 or 70 yards wide at the most and so they were not very far away well let me tell you pandemonium set in uh everybody's uh, shouting um, we ran to the truck. We left every fishing pole, cooler, type of box, all laying on the bank and jumped in my truck and started up out of there. I had to drive down this muddy road and they're screaming, go faster. And I couldn't because the truck was wallowing in these ruts and, the, you know, the bushes almost scrubbing my mirrors on either side. It's just a tight dirt road going in there. Made the curve and I floored it going up that hill. And when I crossed where the gate is at the top of the hill, it's right on the crest. It felt like uh, we went airborne almost when we crossed the top of that hill. We were flying out of there. Well, immediately I slammed on brakes because now the same three uh, balls of fire is still there where I'd seen them at 530 that evening or 515 whatever time it was five, close to 530. The two setting suns that were there, the first two I saw, they were still in the same exact spot, still looking the same. But the third one that appeared and shot down, that's the one that took me. That's the one that I knew saw me. They all did. But it's now in the road in front of us, in the field, it's white now, glowing bright white, and the light swirling around it, and and these look like fingers or blades or spikes of light just going around this thing in the weirdest way. And it's uh, about 45 foot long, 
And that's the way I described it when I reported it. And it's now looking like a, a sort of like a football, or maybe if you took a took that round ball and and when it got near the ground, it kind of squished out. It's more egg shaped now, or football shape. Well. It finally started towards us. It pivoted just like it didn't bank. It just pivoted, and it came right straight down the road towards us. And the the amount of fear and fright and all going on in that truck was deafening. Everybody was shouting, this is the last I'll ever see my family. We thought that we were being invaded totally from um, aliens from another world because we had three on the ground behind us we got three in front of us and there are more flying about in the sky there were eight or nine up there and they're just everywhere there we see them in the sky while we're seeing them on the ground we felt like like we were uh lab rats or like we were you know we were touched we all did i wasn't afraid at that point i just have to say i was still I don't know what they did to me, but they took my fear away. I was just afraid for my son and them. I was more mesmerized by what I was seeing like at that point. You were kind of like observing it from like an out-of-body perspective almost. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Yeah. So we uh, finally this thing gets towards us, and it's gaining altitude, and it went over our my truck. I had the sunroof open. And I could have shot it with a slingshot and it hit it. That's how low it was when it went over. No sound, just just brilliant, blinding, bright white light. And we took off and floored it out of there. And uh, there became a fight in the truck. Who was going to go home first? I mean, it was really something to behold. And there were about three. The the one that won out it was about six miles away. I had to take him on first and turn around and come back three miles to drop the other two off because they lived next door to one another. So that was quite an episode. And and that's only a, just a hint of really what happened down there. There's a whole lot more to it, more detail. And on the ride to their house that night, uh, you'll see this in the book. Um, I had a tragic incident that happened to me in two, 1982. Um, I lost my wife. I found her. She had, had a car wreck. And we were married 11 months and 28 days. And I happened to ride up and see a car laying on its side. And it was, I had no clue who it was. But anyhow, I found her. By stopping to see if anybody was okay, had a, the shock of my life, it was my first wife. We'd been married less than a year, like in two days. Well, what's, the reason I said this story is because I had suffered with PTSD over that all my life. I, I could never get away from uh, how terrible that was and seeing this young 19-year-old girl uh, mangled up and, and died in my arms. Well, the significance about this is when we went, we went, we had to go through that dead man curve to drop these guys off. It was right along the way. I mean, this all happened right close together. And as we were going, approaching this curve, you had to go through it at 35 max. That's how sharp it is. But she'd lost a car in that curve and rolled end over end and threw her out. And, uh, but there was this object hovering right over that very spot. And I hit the brakes and I wanted to stop and get out. And, and they won't have another, none of that. These guys in the truck were fighting me with every breath they had to not stop. And I'm like, but I got to stop. They didn't know why. But this thing spoke to me when I went through that curve and said, you don't worry anymore. You don't have to suffer over this anymore. She's okay. And so, and it's not your fault. I had blamed myself for it. But anyhow, that was, that's in the book. Um, and I don't want to give too much of it away. That's a tragic story. Yeah. That so, really 
uh, that's people want to know why is it a spiritual experience for you? Why did it turn into such a uh, this type of experience? Well, it's it's always been that way uh, because suffering from Crohn's disease, um, I never had it again after that night. They not only took that away from me, uh, they gave me uh, peace of mind over that loss that I'd had years and years earlier that I'd dealt with for most of my adult life. So we drop the guys off, we get home, and um, Christopher is panicked. He's running through the house, going to every room, closing the doors, turning the lights on, had all the outside floodlights on. He even closed the bathroom with no windows in it. He'd turn the light on and lock the door. So he had the whole house locked down and all the lights on. And he comes, I'm in my study looking at the TV, trying to find this invasion that's happening. We're still believing invasion is going on. And so um, he gets to my study after batting the house down. And he said, have you seen anything, Dad? I said, no, it's just, it's just the weirdest thing. It's like there's nothing. And suddenly, living in the country next to my dad's house, we lived on six acres of land, and he had a head of woods behind his house, not far back there. And back in the forest, he had a dog kennel. Still there, he raised dogs. Before I was born, he raised dogs, and hundreds of them. He had a hundred at a time, at times, but usually about 30. That night, there were 15 hound dogs in that kennel. And suddenly they all go to barking, like the scary bark, like I see something, but I don't know what it is. Oh, and no. we, Yeah, we'd heard this noise go over. I thought it was a helicopter because Fort Bragg, I knew the way it come. It come from the direction of Fort Bragg, and the direction it was going was straight to the river, which was only a couple miles away. So he, um, uh, the, when these dogs started barking they were so loud you could hear it from a mile away a hound dog's got a very loud mouth and you take 15 of them and and it was like the scary sound they were you know they were afraid and so christopher and i began our hair standing up like what in the world and the only thing i could think of was not a ufo anymore was oh my lord uh, my dad's got a pretty big garage right by the dog kennel and I just envisioned somebody's breaking in that shop because we had to move. We lost our home and we moved to dad's and all our furniture and boats and uh, equipment, tools and all is in that shop. So I'm envisioning somebody's breaking in this shop and they're taking mine and dad's stuff. So I said, Junior, we got to go see who's somebody's got to be breaking in the shop. And he said, no, daddy, don't go out there. Please don't open that door. And so I, I talked him in to, to go in with me. I said, look, you can stay here. You're not leaving me, he said. I said, well, I'm going to see who's getting in this shop. The dog, we got a 110-pound Chesapeake Bay Retriever, and she's standing on the back steps, the back door, and she's barking every breath. We were looking out the window at her, and her hair is bristled all up. All this loud noise, it was just... It, it elevated our everything. So finally, I opened the door. Christopher had me by the back of the shirt. And the minute I opened that door, Rosie looked up at us and took off toward the dog kennel. She went out there about 40 feet and looked, stopped and looked back to see if we were coming. I said, Christopher, we don't need a flashlight. We know where we're going. We'll sneak down that road using the dark to hide us and just see who might be in that shop. And I'll put Rosie on them. She would, she would attack if I told her to because I've trained dogs all my life. And so he had me by the shirt, and we went off behind Rosie. And we had to go down through our backyard and go through a path through the woods to the kennel. Well, by the time we got to the kennel, there she is with these other 15 hounds. And instead of looking at the shop, which was curious to me, they were looking behind the kennel into the forest. And I thought, this is weird. It can't be a person. Maybe it's a bear. We had bear around, right? Uh, I used to be a big bear hunter. I'm in the Boone and Crockett record book for that. Um, shooting one of the largest black bear in North Carolina. 
And um, to this day, I don't hunt anymore, by the way. I don't want people to think I was transformed by this this whole thing. I don't even hurt a bug anymore. I pick them up and stick them outside instead of squishing them. Uh, it's, if it runs from me, I don't want to hurt it. It don't want to die. And that's not my right to hurt it. So uh, I didn't used to think that way, right? So I took... We, we, we were standing there next to Rosie. She is pointing dead in that forest. She's not looking at me. Her hair is standing up. All these hounds are five to ten foot from us. They're barking every breath. So I said, Christopher, I'm going to send her in the woods on whatever's in there. And we're going to run back the way we came, down this path, to the grass, the backyard. And we're going to go back to the back of the property. And that's to where it's going to go out. It ain't coming our way. She's going to push it out in that direction. So we made the plan, and I took off running hard as I could run. After I sent her in, I bumped her on the rear with my foot and said, get them, girl. And she took off. Jumped right in the thick bushes and barking every breath. Junior and I are running hard as we can. We get to the grass, and it's now frost on the ground. So I slipped as I almost fell. I had to make a left turn to go back to the back. We had a plan to run up to this big oak tree and hide behind it and just watch whatever comes out across our property. But Christopher turned loose at me when I made that left. And because I slipped on the frost, I thought it was because he just pulled a loose from me. Didn't know it, but he had uh, had all he could stand. He didn't want no more of that. And he ran back to the house and went inside and was looking out the back door. I didn't know that, though. I ran all the way to the back, about 100 yards back there, to the tree, this big oak tree, and ran up against it and stop myself against that tree uh, in a full run. Uh, you know, I was just trying to be, I'm, I'm panting. <laughs> so I'm trying to hide my breath, right? I'm trying to keep quiet, and it's hard to, to breathe so heavy and not make a noise because I'm hearing the dogs coming. I'm in front of this dog. I cut her off, and it's coming toward me, barking every breath, not counting the 15 hounds barking. So it was the... It was exciting. I just have to tell like you. Madness, especially the yeah. horror movie scene when you're trying to hold your breath because something's yeah. coming for you. Yeah, yeah, it was like that. Oh. And, and I, so I stopped myself against this tree, and I turned and looked back to see if Christopher was coming. I just knew he was behind me. Well, when I did that, I it, it I had the shock of my life. There behind me. And I believe this thing chased me back there, and I didn't, didn't know it. Um, was standing with them four feet. I could have leaned forward and touched it. And uh, there was this three-foot-tall, same entity Junior talked about, three-and-a-half feet maybe. It looked like um, it had a glass outer covering. It was so shiny. It was brilliant and gleaming. And it was glowing the color of the moon, that soft glow, white. But it was shiny. The outer appearance was like gleaming, almost like gold or some polished stone would have gleamed. And underneath that glow, a bright, I could see what looked like a triangle on its chest right there. And that was very important piece of information when I reported that, that, along with some other details, is what got the U.S. government involved and the Vatican and everybody else that has come here. So um, I, I, I didn't want to get closer to it. I, I got my hands on the tree, and I dropped one to look back, right? and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm dead. That's what I said. So I kind of eased closer to the tree and turned and had my back against the tree, trying not to get close to it. And I said, I surrender. I just told it that I said, I'm sorry. I mean, you no harm. And I heard this voice. It was like um, thunder almost, this, this ring in my head. And it said, you don't understand. We're not here to hurt you. We're here to help you. And about that time when it said that, this dog comes through. It's coming. I'm still hearing Rosie coming. All this happened very quick. And as soon as she broke out of the bushes, this 
being just completely vanished in front of me. And so I ran or trotted. I didn't really run. I'm trying to get my my energy back because it all left me, everything. I was almost uh, shot myself. And I made it back to the house. And I didn't want to tell Chris Jr. what I had just seen because he had had enough of that night. And uh, But I, I will say uh, when Mufon came and they did their investigation, that tree had started dying, limbs falling off of it, and um, they detected this. Um, that they had they had uh, evidence that they found and sent it off, and it came back a very unusual evidence, and and so that was never presented. A friend of mine named Norm Gagnon, he had he was a, a star team investigator. He had the information, but they wouldn't let him use it. That was his job. So um, that was basically, there's a lot more. Uh, we didn't end up staying there that night. We left and slept in the middle of a, a big hay field in the truck with it running so I could see every direction that night. Well, because I can't blame they, you for that after that experience. I do have <laughs> a few questions. So, um when you go to report an extraterrestrial experience, who did you first report it to to then eventually get like the CIA and NASA involved? Well, keep in mind the first when I came home, my wife was at home. She didn't get home to, to Friday that week with the kids. And when I started telling this, and I'm not feeling sick anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it terrified her and the rest of my children so bad, and they were so little. Uh, I didn't think about all that. I just had to tell it. And, well, I got shut down real quick. Mom trying to keep, you know, some kind of uh, sanity in the house. And I, I was mad at her. I didn't realize what she was doing. But anyhow, she was doing the right thing. And suddenly the whole church community starts coming to my house sprinkling holy water on, on my property, walking and praying around. They just knew the devil himself had appeared in front of me. And I was asked to never speak about it again if I wanted to continue going to church, which I, nobody was going to tell me that I wasn't going to talk about this. What happened, I had to tell it. But I, I listened to him under, right, for the first 10 months. Again. I said, especially since you were like your Crohn's disease was healed from this experience. And they're like, no, don't talk about it. Right. Yeah. They didn't understand. And to this day, a lot of the churches don't get it. They've been told uh, it's demonic and they have no clue. They it's just hear nice. some guy hand it down. I mean, it's not in the Bible. They've just been told by this one and that one for 2,000 years, and it's, oh, you can't go there. You can't touch it. You, you, it's, it's demonic. Well, I tell you, I don't believe that. Not for 16 years I've been involved in this and uh, studied more than anybody in the world. And that's not by me. That's by government officials. Uh, but to get back to, to what you asked there, I didn't talk about it. I actually went into depression. I felt like I was being stifled and not allowed to speak about it again uh, because the church put pressure on me. My wife did for to keep the kids sane, right? But yet I was still, the phenomena started appearing in the house It right away. It, it came into our house. The orb would appear in the house and flash, and these shadowy beings would come out of them and walk through walls and fall. My wife was seeing it. The kids were seeing it. And finally, October of that year, 10 months later, um, I had applied and got internet. I didn't have any money, right? I couldn't even feed my kids. I had to apply for free lunches at school. That's how bad it had gotten. So we got internet and I uh, started seeing the UFO files and saw this guy on there named Stanton Friedman that it was a, a a nuclear physicist, I thought, wow, if this guy can talk about it, I'm going to. And he mentioned this outfit called MUFON, never heard of. 
So I Googled them and found their report your incident page and I wrote it out. This was in October of that same year, 10 months later. And I went to hit sand and I thought, if I do this, I may lose my family. I've been warned not to talk about this, so I'm not going to do it. And I waited. I was afraid I would lose my family. So two weeks went by, and I agonized so bad over it. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit send, and I did. And I thought the relief come from me. At least I got it off my chest. Somebody will hear it. Well, immediately, within a day, I get a call from California. We got to come see you. I'm like, oh, no, you're not coming here. I, I just wanted to, to send the thing in. I don't mean to have people come to my house. That would be bad. So I told them no. That was in October. Come January, they sent me a, a letter and said, I guess since you don't want to talk about it, we're going to close your case. And that hit me pretty hard. I said, no, I got to talk. I got to speak to somebody. This is going to kill me. I can't sleep. I'm having nightmares. My brain hurts. I fall asleep. I would pass out if somebody asked me any details because whatever they did to me caused this tremendous pain and um, headache, and I would actually pass out. So they came in February or March, late February, early March, and by June they had convinced me to do a, a Discovery Channel show. We're going to vindicate you. Uh, this will be great. Maybe your neighborhood and your community and your church will understand, you know, this is vindication. We are going to tell them, you really did see this. Well, that was the biggest mistake I had made. And um, they actually tried, they did a hit piece on me and tried to make me look like a liar. Um, and I have evidence, proof of that. And it, it, But what happened was, to answer your question, when I reported it, when I went on the database, the government knew about it immediately. Did you report yeah. the triangle thing too in your report? Only on the chest of the being, yeah. right? I included that. Okay. I drew it. Chris Jr. drew it too. And so when I reported it, it got the attention of CIA and NASA and everyone. So by June of, uh, or July that year of, um, of, uh, 2008, uh, Ryan from Blood So Said So calls me. He's at home. He's just 14 years old. Dad, there's this giant of a man here from NASA. He wants to meet you. And we were definitely afraid of government at that time because the MUFON gang came in and warned us the men in black will kill you. They'll get you. You don't. You stay away from government. They're dangerous. So we, we were programmed with all that stuff in this UFO crowd right away. And so my family was afraid. NASA's coming. Oh, my God. The men in black's coming. It was on the television back then. You know, that was when the movies come out. So I didn't want to talk to the guy, but I said, Ryan, tell him I'll be home in an hour. I'll, you know, stick around. And he did. And, um... He's like, we want to talk about that little being with the triangle on his chest. Tell us more about that. And that turned into a 11-year friendship with one of the oldest ranking guys at NASA. He was there in 1956 before it was NASA. And he ended up, my children loved him. For the first couple of years, we were afraid of them until we started having more government folks come in. And we finally realized, Cheyenne, that it was the people. It was the UFO world. It was the community. It was the churches. It was everybody that uh, was giving us a problem. But it was not the government people that was giving us the problem. They were the ones trying to help the family understand what happened. It was that guy from NASA that went to my dad's house next door, knocked on his door without me knowing, and flipped his badges out and said, Lord, you got to believe your son. 
So um, really contradictory of a lot of the stories that you will hear because I have heard the horror stories of the intimidation of you know like sign this NDA, don't talk about it. If you do talk about it, we're not really sure what's going to happen to you or your family. So the fact that you you do have a positive story about the government coming in and being like, we want to help you understand this. Yeah. Also I mean, yeah. makes me super curious of the information that they actually have on the being with the triangle on its chest. It's yeah. just like um, in anything and energy, they say like if you want to, you know, picture the protection around you, a lot of people picture a glowing orb, but the best conduit of energy is a triangle because you're going right. to have that that base and then shooting it up, you know, you don't right. want to get in the great pyramids, right? Like understanding energy. But as soon as you said triangle, I was like, I mean, they they are 10 times more advanced than us. That's probably why they keep us out and, you know, can come down to the density that we are on Earth. But I'm always so curious, like, were they able to divulge any further information to you of like, oh, yes, we have reports of crafts that look like this or beings that look like this. Like, were they able to do that or were they just trying to kind of help you get your mind back at the time because your frame of reference had kind of been broken from your experiences. Well, it was all, yeah. My whole world was turned upside down. All this is new, right? And um, I ended up, if you read the book, this is just touching the, the tip of what happened and where it has gone in 16 years. Um, Yes, to answer your question, yeah, I learned a lot. I've been in mission control. Uh, I met the general that ran NASA when I was there as a lady. Um, uh, sat in John Glenn's chair in the astronaut crew quarters, and there has never been but 300 people in the history of that facility ever been in that building. Only one U.S. president, no congressman, not allowed. But yet they opened the facility for me. And it's in the book why they did that. Um, nice cliffhangers. Not, let's say again. I said nice cliffhangers. Yeah. Like, All yeah, right, it's, the book. Good to know I'll get my answer when I get to that page. <laughs> yeah, it's really incredible why, and you'll learn a whole lot. I can tell you that the triangle... Wonder why there are pyramids. Wonder why there are symbols with a triangle with a circle around it. Um, wonder why there's a snake chasing his tail with a triangle in the middle. Um, Wait a minute. They had the snake eating its tail? What is that? Called? Well, I'm just saying, wonder why you see these symbols that people wear on oh, the lapel okay. of a snake. Meant, like in the triangle oh. being i'm like holy crap that is a very ancient symbol uh well all that coincides with this being and this triangle on his chest because he told me i asked the you know the beings never quit coming last night i took 34 videos 34 the night before 39 uh, the night before over 40 and uh, one of the ladies that's in the book, her name is Sharon. You'll read about her. A miracle happened with her. And um, she came. She came last night, her and her best friend. And the 34 videos we took last night, two were in the air. So 32 of them were ground level orbs around us. They're not just in the air. They come out of the forest. Um, yeah, I had to throw that in there. So it's an ongoing thing. That's why the government has, uh, I've worked with them pretty much many different agencies. Let's not say the agency, although they sent people here, but individuals from different agencies, um, representatives from many, many places. They're still coming even greater, uh, and it'll come public this year. There's, uh, it, it, let's just say, Come Jan June, July this year through August, uh, I think everybody will get a new understanding um, by television. 
uh, a lot more about this and uh, about what's going on here with me and my family and my children. You'll get to see it live um, filming of it. I can't say anymore, but it is, disclosure is fastly approaching. There's no going back. And uh, it's just the beginning of what's taking place as far as studying this phenomenon. It's just going to get better, and it's exciting. Um, I don't claim to know the answers at all, although it's always been a spiritual thing. Even though it scared the daylight out of me um, to begin with, it, it turned into a spiritual experience. You know, I was praying, Lord, help me. And that's where I was when I was on the river. I'm crying out to God, help me. I can't feed my children. I can't work. I'm sick. What do I do? And that's when they came, when I was at the lowest point in my life. And they still come. They're still here. Uh, I have a conversation with them. I go out and I ask for them to come, and here they come. And we videoed it. Uh, I've got 2,000. 100 videos taken. I checked this morning right at that. Uh, it's actually 2086 I've taken in the last less than two years. So that's a lot. And, um, and not all by myself. A lot of people, government witnesses, scientists, academics. Uh, you'll, you'll even see academics appear this summer talking about their experiences with me. So it's really exciting where it's going to go. Um, Did I read somewhere that you acquired healing gifts after your experience? Well, I don't like to say I have acquired it or I have well, anything. Like, you, know, you have magical powers by any means, but I always believe we're all <laughs> conduits for the divine, right? Like right. all channels to be worked through. So after your disease was miraculously healed were you able in any facet of your life to be able to you know kind of channel that divinity healing s powers onto any other experiences you don't have to go into detail i was just making sure i read that correctly that you had experienced basically heightened clear senses after the experiences that you had well i'll leave a little cliffhanger of in the book, you will. <laughs> <laughs> let's just say um, word got around uh, because of, uh, uh, and the only way I found out was I have a, uh, I had a Labrador retriever. Her name was Nellie, and somehow or another uh, she had gotten injured, and a gash across the side of her neck was about two inches long and very deep. And she was bleeding like bleeding to death. Blood was shooting out of her neck everywhere. There happened to be a researcher there that day when it happened. She bled all over his legs when she walked by. And she ran in the house, and I tackled her on the floor. I had to run and get her. But when I saw her bleeding, I'm, and she was laying beside us. She had up blood everywhere. And when I brought her out of the house, blood's it's greasy on my laminate floor. It's real greasy, like, you know, so I'm slipping and sliding. I get her out, and I lay her on the concrete. All these witnesses there, and I knew she was going to die. I just knew it. There weren't no dog veterinarian within miles. I couldn't get her nowhere close quick enough to save her. And I had my hand pressed on her neck, and blood coming up through my fingers, and I put pressure, and I looked up at everybody and said, oh, my God, what do I do? And everybody's like, you know, there's six, eight people there. It's in the book. And I just raised my head to the sky and said, Lord, help me. And immediately it disappeared in front of everybody. And that sent ripples through Washington. And it led to me being called by uh, people that you'll read about to downtown Washington, to one of the uh, um, one of the elite families of Washington. Uh, in fact, I made reservations yesterday to go there, back up there to spend a couple of days with he and his mom and 
Um, my friend Jim Simi Van, that's in the book, he wrote the Ford. He's uh, head of clandestine operations for the CIA for years. He was he was one of the top guys there. But it was a friend of his. A uh, young boy was dying with mitochondrial DNA disease. He could not eat, never could eat, threw up profusely. He's now 12 years old. He's got a feeding tube. He was given a make-a-wish. Um, he was he was President Obama gave him his make a wish in his Oval Office sitting on his desk, and he wanted to be an Army man. So they let him play in the Pentagon basement with um, Delta Force type people, and he's in the book uh, uh, with Mike Morrell's book. The the I think it's called the Last the Great. I, I forget the name of it, but little Brandon's in that book with his. What exactly what I'm telling playing in the basement. So I got a call. It was for for July 2015. Can you come to Washington tomorrow? We got a child that has no hope. They've exhausted every means they know to help him. And um, we just hope maybe you can. They had heard about the dog. And so I'm like, uh, can it wait to Monday? It's, it's, it's like Thursday and 4th of July is this week. My kids are coming home from college and we're going on vacation somewhere. And they're like, what matters more? This child or your vacation? I said, oh, you got me there. This is all in the book. So they flew me next day up there and I met this most courageous, beautiful young fella. I mean, he never complained, even though you could see it on his face. Very frail. His mama's a doctor. His grandpa's a cardiologist in New York. He'd been to the Mayo Clinic. He'd been to Boston. He'd been everywhere you could think to help him, and nobody could help him. And I was terrified. Lord, what did I do? How did this happen to me? I don't know what happened to my dog. I don't know why this dog was healed. I don't know how to heal this boy. I don't know what to do. And I was, But I agreed to go. And I sat there in his house with his family. We had dinner. They're beautiful people. I love them to death. Become great friends um, for life. And um, I sat there, and they really wanted to hear me tell my story more than anything. And I told it, but the whole time I'm sweating, what do I do to help this child? And something just said, hug him. And I did. And um, he's a junior in college now, starting. Yeah, so, up. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's been my experience that's the beginning of it there's so much more in this book uh 16 years of this and um the lady that was here last night she experienced uh two miracles with cancer and i'll just say it's not me it's it's, it's these celestial beings which i think they're the angels from the bible I don't. I haven't seen an alien, what I would call an alien. I haven't seen flying saucers and all that. It's always been balls of fire, balls of light. I have video of orbs appearing and flashing and out steps this glowing light being six foot from me. I have it on video. And the lady that it appeared beside me with uh, was had cancer, and she's cancer free today. Um, so yeah, this is why the book is titled like it is because I it's been I love the cover. Um, I watched the documentary on them pulling apart this Da Vinci painting, what the, you know, the globe means, the way right. the hands are pointed up, like all the way. So when I got the book, I, I felt spiritually connected to it. And then, I mean, I'm a big science spirit bridger anyways, my logical brain, you know, wants to ground as much as possible because I am human. Um, and usually right. if I don't understand it, I just give the rest over to faith, right? But um, like I said in the beginning, I think it takes a tremendous amount of courage to come forward about 
any experience that we have that goes against the like status quo, the norm, you know, even the Bible, so to speak. Um, so my heart goes out to you and your family for continuing to fight for the direct experience that you had, because I think we all have a right and a freedom to speak about what we're experiencing, even even if you don't believe it, you know, I'm pretty open minded and I'll believe anything that anyone tells me because I'm I'm not here to judge anybody's story by any means. But right. um, yeah, I mean, it's just another one of those stories that I hear that just kind of shakes me up and just it does remind you like we aren't alone. But we have been kind of trained and limited in a sense of what it would be like if something extraterrestrial ever did come to us extraterrestrial angelic celestial you know whatever word we'd like to use but the same uh, words right yeah same words definitely um do you have do you plan on writing any more books after this continuing on the journey well you know uh, i would say maybe at some point but right now all i can do is uh, it's been like the biggest job I think I've ever had to get to where I'm at at this point. And we're just now starting to translate this book into Spanish, which hopefully by summertime is, uh, we get it to the, the editor to format. And so I'm still so deep into this book and, and all I haven't even really contemplated going there yet but i'm sure we may pick up at some point where it all stopped and go forward and but i don't know yet um i, I just it's all i can do to uh, it's like i've got six podcasts between yesterday and monday and it was just every day and you know uh, I, i'm traveling out of state next week for filming we'll be doing some filming for three or four two two days of next week and um i'll probably be in mexico by june july so i've got a big plate so of you got a big rock. old tour ahead of you <laughs> well i couldn't yeah. be happier for you even though the circumstances were quite scary and miraculous at the same time but your chronic illness uh, my still. computer just said yeah. There we go. My battery was just saying running low and it had plugged in, but Yeah, I don't wanna lose ya. We're getting ready to <laughs> wrap up my goodbye with ya. Um, like I said, I know it was scary and miraculous. I really enjoy you coming on and telling your story and being so transparent and bold with all the details that you brought. Um, thank you again for the book. I look so forward to reading it and keeping up with your journey and definitely checking out more bled so said so yeah yeah so i really just wish you all the best of luck and everything that you're doing because like i said i think it's courageous to talk about this and i mean there's been so many ufo sightings lately right like just everyday people i remember a news report came out the other day where they like caught even like pictures of the aurora borealis like from photographs in the midwest so there's something definitely coming. The disclosure you said is coming. My heart goes out to people that don't want to break break the, the no. tunnel vision that they have in and understand that there has to be more out there. And, um, yeah, I mean, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing your story. It's powerful, and I'm just so grateful I got to meet you. Yeah, same here. And look, I'd be glad to come back on your show. You want to have me on? A, you can. You know how to catch me. Um, just just send me a note, and um, I'll share my email and all with you here in a little while. You can just call me direct or whatever. And but I appreciate you. I appreciate this interview has been great, enjoyable. Not all have been right because sometimes I'm left trying to talk with no direction, but it's not been that case here. And so well, I'm happy to hear that. I want it to feel just like a conversation amongst friends. Like I'm learning from you and if you pick something up from me, that's super cool too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 
But, um, well, before we get off here, I do like to end my episodes with music. So I have about a 20 second clip from a Goose concert I uh, did back in November. I don't know if you're going to hear it on your side. So if you just give me a minute to play this sweet little clip of one of my favorite bands for the audience, and then I'll grab that email when we're I'm off the record. So not all of Spotify and YouTube has your contact information. <laughs> uh, so let me say this. Um, if you interested in the book, you can, you can get it two ways. You can get it off of Amazon or you can go to my website. My website is uh, UFO of Uh, I got lucky and got the same dot com as my book title. Very nice. Yeah, awesome. but on there you will see um, we're building this website. It, it has a link to Amazon there, but it also has uh, testimonies from government witnesses and um, friends and academics and uh, a lot of other interactive stuff we're going to put on there before we're just slowly building it but it's a great you can find my social media facebook instagram on instagram i post videos um I like a, like i said i have thousands but i put about 50 on there just different ones for people to see and we're going to be releasing more on there as time comes I'm glad to keep up with you. I'll be adding you to all of my stuff. And my listeners know if you go to the description box on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever you're listening to us, all you got to do is hit the description. You'll have Chris's story. You will have links to all of his social media that he just recommended, his website to see the testimonials, and definitely the Amazon link to buy your copy of UFO of God. So yeah. <laughs> thanks again. And uh, yes, you are more than welcome to come back on my show anytime. I'll be happy to reach out and check on you. And then when you want to come back on, tell me about all your trips and all your adventures. I love follow up stories and just continuing <laughs> to learn and hear about everybody's journeys. Beautiful. I appreciate you, Cheyenne. I appreciate you, too. And to all my friends out there still listening to us. Vitality Exposed is going to bring us goose. It's a little clip of undecided. About 20 seconds. I didn't get a lot because I had to turn the volume down and scream my head off to this. So here's a little bit of guitar for y'all.